I wanted to give a quick overview on how to use Vivado to create a simple project, implement it in System Verilog, simulate it to verify that the design is working as expected, and then create a bit file that we could then use to program an FPGA board, in this case, a basis three from Digilent. So when you start Vivado, comes up with this default screen. After you have created previous projects, you'll see that previous projects will populate on a tile on the right. But if you haven't created any projects previously, it'll look like this. And so the first step is to create a project in here. So when you're creating a project, you want a project to be one design. Right? So if you may have multiple components, you may have multiple modules that could all fit under one project, um, but one project should be essentially one thing that you want to build, maybe one thing that you would want to program your FPGA board, right? If you want to change the design, if you want to make something very different, um, you should start with a new project. Even if you want to reuse some of the modules, you can copy them in, um, but Think about it, every design, um, every device should be its own project, right? So creating a project and click next. And so a couple things, the project needs a name. And so I'm just going to call this something like Avado Demo. Um, and so the important thing is with the name, you can use um, letters, you can use numbers, just make sure there's no spaces, right? No spaces, and that's important. The other thing is this location. You can put this a project, you can save it. Um, I'm gonna change this default location. Um, and the key thing to your, uh, again, your location needs to be no spaces, right? So you want no spaces anywhere in the path for your project, right? So I have a, actually have a predefined workspace for all of my Vivado projects. And so I just saved them all there. Um, but you'll see in this entire path, right? There are no spaces anywhere, right? So no spaces, um, that's the key. So clicking next, we're gonna do an RTL project. And so RTL is just more standard, um, uh, design with System Verilog or VHDL, right? Typically always an RTL project. Um, we're not, we can skip this and say, do not specify sources. You can add or define sources when you make the project, or you can make the project and then add sources later or both, some combination. Um, so for now, I'm not going to add any sources so that I can show how to add them afterwards, uh, which is probably more common. Um, so let me click next. Next thing is, is you need to pick the device that you ultimately want to program this to. And so this uh, largely becomes important only if you're actually gonna put this on an FPGA hardware device. And so using the basis three, um, this is a general purpose. It's an Atrix seven, uh, the CPG 236, right? This is for, again, the basis three. Um, which is this size. So if you're using this board or um, the basis three, it's this uh, Atrix 7, um, that's a 35 is the size, right? Specifying essentially how big, how many logic gates essentially this device has. And so this is the one that I will be using. And so this kind of gives a quick summary about what it's to do. We click finish and it will create all, all of the folder structure and some sort of default project files that will be ready to go. And so um, here, got a couple important screens, right? In this top left corner, right? This is sources. So this is every source that we add, whether it's a design source or a simulation source or constraint file. And we'll talk about what all of those are as we go through it. Um, but these will all populate here. Um, and this is always a good place to look because if Vivado 
um, interpreted your design, if your design has some sort of error in it, some common um, coding mistake, right? Sometimes it'll show up right away here where it's clear that um, the synthesizer did not interpret or understand something properly um, and does not have this organized, right? And so that's usually the first telltale sign that you've made some sort of coding mistake somewhere in your HDL. And so if we want to add a source, there's a couple places to do it. One, we have this plus sign here that we could add a source. Uh, you also have um, add sources up here under the file menu, either place, right? It's the same thing um, It will bring up this dialog box, which tells you what type of source. And so the three types of sources are constraints. We'll get to those later. Design sources, simulation sources, right? So if this kind of fits it if we're talking about the actual device that we're designing, right? We're describing this hardware, this structure, right? That's a design source. If we want to test or verify this design, right? We will do that inside a simulation, right? Typically we call these test benches. And so those would be our simulation sources. And then finally, when we want to actually take this design and connect it to some physical piece of hardware, those are constraints that we can add um, that would help uh, tell Vivado when it synthesizes it and when it does its placing and routing on, on where to make these connections to the actual components and pins of our FPGA. So we start with a design source and we can so there's a couple ways we can add design sources. So if we want to add previously created design sources, we can just add files, or we could add directories of files, right? And so this is how you could take previous designs and you could bring them in and copy them into a brand new project and kind of reuse those design files over and over again. Um, we don't have any, so we're gonna create a file. So again, you can click the create a file button here. You could also click um, this plus sign, right, um, which gives you essentially the same options that these buttons are. And so we want to create a file. And so this is important for uh, if you want to use System Verilog. Um, system Verilog will never show up as the default. And so um, System Verilog is the language that uh, I'm preferring to use, even though I'm not technically using any of those specific constructs um, in this design, but System Verilog uh, has to be selected because it will never be the default, um, unfortunately, in Vivado. And then we need to give this uh, file a name. And so typically, we will create a module. You could think of a module as like a single black box uh, part of your design. Um, this is going to be a very simple design. It's going to only have one level, so one module. And so um, sometimes you might have the top module have some sort of top in it and sub modules um, somewhere else. So uh, I'm just going to call this demo, which kind of generic for uh, what this module we called. So it creates this file and then we can click finish. <sighs> And so it starts adding the sources. One thing that Vivado does is it will create a wizard to sort of help um, add inputs and outputs automatically. Um, you can either skip this and add them yourself in your design file, or you can go through and actually uh, have it pre-populate inputs and outputs. And so if we're gonna make a design, first we need to figure out what we're going to do. And so for this example, this is the device that I am going to make, right? So it's a simple three input, two output, just a couple logic gates here. Um, so three AND gates, an OR gate, an exclusive OR gate, uh, signals for FG and H. I'm not necessarily going to implement these as separate signals. I've just labeled them to maybe clarify what this design does or how this works. Uh, but, right, so we've got an anding of A and B and a B and C, right, is two AND gates, and then those two signals get exclusive or together, and that would be X. Uh, we have A and B, B and C, A and C, right, those outputs of all three of those AND gates uh, get ORG, 
and the ORing of those three is what is output to Y. So in this, right, if I'm looking at this as a top level single box, right, I have three inputs, A, B, and C. I have two outputs, X and Y. And so those are my signals, right? Simple design, these signals are all single bit um, signals, so nothing really uh, complicated. And so I'm going to actually use this, this module wizard box to define the inputs and outputs. And so my module will automatically be populated with them and I don't have to create them later. And so I have a signal A, a signal B, a signal C, and notice those are all inputs. I have an X that is going to be an output, right? And unfortunately, this doesn't automatically scroll, so you actually have to drag this box to make it bigger. Um, a Y that's an output as well. If these weren't um, single bit signals, if these were buses or multiple bit signals, right, I could easily create them and then define their size. And so this allows me to do that as well. In this case, everything's just a single bit, right? Again, staying very simple. And so three inputs, two outputs, click OK, and it will automatically generate my code. It'll create the um, system variable code to define this module, to define those inputs, to define those outputs, um, and make this ready to go. It actually shows up under here in my design source. And so notice, right, this um, little symbol, this little icon here, it's showing that this file is the top level. It's just the top level of my design. If I had multiple modules, multiple design files that were sub modules or components, they would populate underneath here. Um, that would give us a telltale sign that it understood the architecture and the hierarchy. Um, and so again, we wanna see this uh, pretty much universally in Bovado. We like seeing this teal color dot that's usually a good sign. Um, if you get red question marks here, that's usually a sign that there is some sort of syntax error somewhere um, in your file. Right? So if I double click on this, right, it should bring up um, my module. All right, a couple things. It gives this a uh, nice default code block. Right, I can expand this. Um, I usually like keeping parts of it, uh, but this is typically a little bit more robust than most of the designs that, that I end up doing um, in class. And so I, I know. usually I'm not worried about a design name, a module name, a project name. Usually those don't matter so much. Target device and we'll typically include basis. This usually does not have any dependencies. I usually don't need other comments. Um, a, uh, but so usually it's worthwhile to, um, to have this. This becomes very handy as you move on um and start making modules that, that may have different parameters that may have different limitations or specifications um especially for things like uh, if you have a design that starts using clocks and clocks are expected to be certain frequencies or there are ranges of frequencies that work there's ranges of inputs um usually this description becomes more and more useful okay so in our code here, right, we have our module definition. And so um, in Verilog, right, of course, it's got our inputs and our outputs. And so again, this was already predefined, right? This was done with that module wizard. And so all I need to do is connect my um, outputs to my inputs. And so in system Verilog, right, this design, again, refreshing this, right, where X is going to be the exclusive OR of A, B, and B, C, right? I can do a 
sine x equals um, a and b exclusive ord with b and and c and we can do a sine y to be a and b ord with b and c ord with um, a and c And so that's it, right? Uh, describing this device is relatively straightforward um, using a continuous assignment statement, right? So describing this hardware structurally, right? describing essentially each logic gate and how it's connected. Um, again, using parentheses to make this very implicit and obvious on order and uh, order of operations or order in which the logic gates are laid out. So I can save this, so control S, or there is a um, save button here. And once again, right, this sources, right, this would show up um, if something was wrong, if something didn't make sense, it would typically pop up there. Usually the first thing I like doing before doing a full synthesis, because a synthesis could take a while, um, especially as your design gets more complex and larger, um, kind of a quick test to see, does this look right, right? Does this sort of make sense? Is I always like looking at the elaborated design where Vivado will create a circuit schematic um, interpreting what this design looks like. And so, when we do this, we should get something that may not look exactly like this, but it should be equivalent to what we have here. So I should see something like this. And so we can open the elaborated design. This will take a little bit of time. Still, this is typically quicker than a full synthesis. Um, and go to a kind of a quick check. Um, Usually this is also really good to see if inputs or outputs end up being disconnected because they come up and they become very obvious. But here we have our three inputs, A, B, and C, right? And we have AND gates. So we have A and B ANDed. Um, and this goes to one of the OR gates or to the exclusive OR, right? So that matches. We have B and C also goes to my exclusive OR, which goes to X. So this is actually exactly like my um, design in the previous one, right? So the exclusive OR of those two. And this AND gate is C and A, so A and C. So here was my A and B, my B and C, my A and C, right? So um, A and B uh, gets AND or OR here with the B and C, and then that gets ORed with A and C. So rather than doing one OR gate with three inputs, right, they just elaborated out to two OR gates of two inputs, right, same logic structure. And so this logically fits and is the same thing that I had in my picture here. So that's usually a good sign, right? Things look right. It seemed to interpret what I described as intended um, and so a good kind of safe check that this sort of makes sense. The next thing I like doing after I have this is I always like to simulate this, right? To verify that I get the behavior that I'm expecting. And so the easiest way to do this is to create a test bench. And so a test bench is imagine a virtualized workbench, right? So if I had this design, this module, right, as a box, right, let's say I had it as a IC chip, and I had it in my lab, and I wanted to see, does this chip do what I want, right? Well, I would set it down, and I would hook signals up to it, maybe a power supply, maybe a function generator, right? And then I would look at the outputs, right? So I'm looking at A, B, and C, and I'm going to change those inputs. And then I'm going to look at X and Y as outputs. And as I change A, B, and C, I should see X and Y. And I should be getting outputs that I expect. 
that would fit in um, maybe a truth table that I could have for the design as I built it or as I've designed it. And so if I get X and Y to be ones and zeros for the correct places for all of my A, B, and C combinations, right? I could say that this thing is functioning or behaving uh, logically as expected, right? So I would do that in a physical workbench. Well, Vivando allows me to create that same sort of scenario, but virtualized. And so rather than having my function generator in my oscilloscope or multimeter, right, I can virtualize those things and I can hook my component up and then connect them to signals that I could then control and then monitor the outputs and make sure that the signals match as expected, right? And so I do all of this with a test bench or with a simulation source. So um, this elaborate design, I'm gonna close this section, right? Because that looked good. So I'm back here to my design source. So I want to add a new source and I wanna create a simulation source. And so I create a new file. And again, I'm gonna change this to system Verilog, right? Because system Verilog never shows up as the default. And so when doing my naming scheme, um, my test bench, I'm going to make a test bench specifically for a testing a specific part. Now, which part am I testing? I'm going to test my demo part. So if my demo part is the part I want to test, then I typically like to call this demo underscore TV. So it's the test bench for what? It's a test bench for this demo module or this demo device. So finish. Now, in a test bench, the test bench has no inputs and outputs. All right. We create internal signals that we connect that I'm going to test to my part, but the test bench itself has no inputs and outputs, which sort of makes sense because on your workbench that you would be testing a part, you have no inputs and outputs coming in or out of my test bench. They're all internal. right? They're all signals and equipment that's on my test bench. Maybe that will help. So yeah, leaving this blank. And so my simulation source shows up here. Notice demo also shows up. So your design sources show up. Um, and this is not the hierarchy that I want. And that's because I haven't written my test bench yet. Um, but under my simulation, I don't want my design as the top level. And we'll see how this should look when we're done. Um, and we'll come back and check this before we actually run the simulation just to make sure that all of our um, code was understood properly before we waste the CPU cycles. And so here, um, I usually don't worry as much about this top block for um, doing my test benches, which maybe that's bad. Uh, but in my demo, right? There are no inputs and outputs. There are no inputs and outputs um, in your test bench. So no inputs and outputs, but we do have some internal signals. And so for the internal signals, um, I'm going to create some, right? I need something that's going to connect to my inputs. So I need something that's going to connect to A, B, and C. And then I need something that's outputting um, X and Y. And so these are all single bits. So I'm just going to use logic type, right? Again, since it's system Verilog, logic will work. And so um, I'm going to call these, uh, I'm going to separate them as A test bench and B test bench and C test bench. I don't need to. I could call these A, B, and C, but I'm specifically using a different name to kind of help show um, the difference when we actually start using them. So when we start talking about how these signals get used or wired into the actual part that we're testing, um, I'm using a, a different name so that it becomes um, more clear how that works, right? Okay. So I have my inputs and my outputs connected. And so then I need to just wire up my device. And so we want to instantiate an instance, right? A copy of my design 
and then wire the connections, wire the inputs A, B, and C to my A, T, B, B, T, B, C, T, B, and what are my outputs X and Y to X, T, B, and Y, T, B. And so how we do this in System Verilog is we give it the design name, and then we give it a um, the instance needs some name. Um, and so we typically use UUT. UT um, stands for unit under test. So I'm taking a copy of what? A copy of a module called demo, which is what this module is. And I'm going to create an instance of it. This instance is going to be called UUT. And so I'm going to wire connections up. And so demo has multiple connections. It has a connection to A. And so I use dot A. That's going to connect to the input A, the input A of demo. And so what do I wire it up to? I wire it up to A test bench. And then I have an input B. And I wire that up to B test bench, right? And so all of my inputs or outputs, all of those signals are separated by commas, right? And so we have a dot to separate, right? That's the input of demo. And then this is what we're connecting it to, right? Outputs work the exact same way. It's also important that you check case, case, um, we want to make sure that, you know, capital, because case matters in Verilog, so capital X, lowercase x um, can be different. And so I have now wired up a instance of demo. I've called this instance UUT, and I've connected input A to ATB, input B to BTB, input C to T C T B, input X to XTB, input Y to YTB, right? Sorry, X and Y are outputs. Um, but I've made those connections. Now, I'm not done, but we can kind of see if this works properly, because when I save it, right, we should see something happen over here if this was interpreted properly. And notice the structure changed, right? So notice my test bench is now my top level. And that's what we want. Because when I'm doing my sim, when I'm running my simulation, I want to simulate my test bench, because my test bench is setting up all the signals that I'm going to test and showing me the signals I want to look at. Right? Now, under this, notice we now have an instance. We have an instance of what? Well, we have an instance of demo. And this instance is called UUT. And so if I don't see this hierarchy, then I would no longer need, I wouldn't need to try to run the simulation, right? Running the simulation until we have this would be just wasting CPU cycles because it doesn't matter where I'm going to get. It's either going to be garbage that's worthless or it's going to give me an error, right? Because this is what I want to see. I want to see my, my test bench as the top level, and I want to see the part that I'm testing as a sub-module underneath it because that's what this is doing, right? Okay. So now... Um, I need to look at my inputs and change them. Um, and then as I change them, I can look at the outputs in a waveform when the simulation runs to see if this thing works as expected. And so uh, we can do all of this in an initial block. And so an initial block will just run once and then not repeat, and then the test bench will be over. And so I can control my signals. Right. So here I can start with all of my signals um, as zero, and then um, I want them all to be zero, and I need it to run a certain amount of time so I can actually see this. Right. Because in this initial block, as I change things, right, the time between A being set to zero and B being set to zero is, you know, instantaneous, right? These two run sequentially, but they run with no time change. And so all of these happen zero at the same instance. 
And then before I change it to go to the next input I want to test, I need to give it some time. I want to give it a certain amount of time before I then change the inputs. So I'm delaying 10, and in this case, it's 10 nanoseconds. Nanoseconds because of this time scale up here, which is the default of auto uses, which is fine for, for what I'm doing here today. And so after this, um, I'm just going to copy this line to make this easy and make it easy to follow. So then I'm going to do 000, then I'm going to do 001. I'm going to wait 10 nanoseconds. Actually, let me just copy this whole thing. And then we might do 0010. Now, I don't need to keep setting A to 0. I, I could get rid of this. Um, since it's already zero, it's going to stay zero until I change it to something else. Um, the only reason I have it here is because it's easier to copy and paste this and kind of go down. Um, but now we have one, one, and then one, zero, zero, and then one, zero, one. And then one, one, zero. We'll need this last 10. And then one, one, one. And so, right, this, since I copied this line, it sort of does make it nice. It should follow my truth table, right? Four zeros, four ones, two zeros, two ones, two zeros, two ones, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Right, which would probably be the standard typical order of sequence that you would have if you had this in a truth table. And so I should be able to see what each of these does um, and then kind of follow the output and compare it to a truth table that I probably previously made to make sure that this simulation matches expected. Right. Okay. So we can save this again. Right. Again, this is updating, so we don't want this to change, which is good. Right. We see this exactly like it is. So good. Test bench at the top. The module that we're testing underneath it. Right. We get these nice tail dots, no red, no question marks. All this looks good. And so we can run the simulation and we're going to do a behavioral simulation. Um, these other post synthesis, post um, implementation, those. Uh, become more timing specific for the actual hardware, right? For the device you have. Um, not worried about those, uh, especially for a design this simple. You just want to see, does it logically do as expected? And so behavior works fine for that. This behavioral design is ideal, right? So everything happens. Gates, no propagation delay, all things change instantaneous. Um, and so here we have it, right? Here is our wave, unfortunately, um, it gets zoomed in and default to some odd scale, which is not really that useful. Um, one of the most useful sort of gestures in this is if you click and you drag to different corners, right, you can get different zoom, right? So you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can zoom for a certain segment, or you can zoom fit. So zoom fits kind of nice. And you'll see all of the interesting stuff happens here, right? And so then we could try to zoom in on something like this. And this would probably work. We could kind of see it. Um, one quick trick that I like doing, um, I'm, I want to know how long my test bench should run. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? I'm running eight different test cases. Each test case should take 10 nanoseconds. So that means the whole simulation should only take 80. And so what I will typically do is I will go up to this time scale up here and I will tell my um, simulation to restart, right? So this actually sets me back to time zero. And then I can say run for a specific amount of time. And so in this case, I know 80 nanoseconds will work. Eight test cases, 10 nanoseconds for each test case, 80 is all I need. And then I can tell it to run. Instead of having it run for a default amount of time, which is um, 
I believe it's one millisecond, which is way longer than I need in this case. I only need 80, so I can run for just this specific time, right? Notice the tool pop up actually tells me the time, so I'm gonna run for 80, right? Which is exactly all I need. And then what's nice is then I can just zoom and this left diagonal, I zoom to fit, and there we go. I've got a nice scaled in example where I can see, right, what happens. And so if I'm anding all three of these, right, all three of those ands, I'm looking at my F, G, and H signal, right, F, G, and H, these would all be zero in this case. And so zeros exclusive ord is zeros, zeros ord is zeros, right? So that makes sense, um, right? In this case, right, there's still only one input, so Right, ending with zeros no matter what, it's still the same, still the same. And then here, right, once I have B and C, right, B and C, once this becomes a one, right, one exclusive or, as long as this is a zero, which it is, this will be a one. Once this is a one, Y is going to be a one no matter what. And so we kind of see these happen. All right, and so we could trace this through. For all of these others, right, we could do every single test case to kind of see what happens. Um, and you should see that X and Y kind of fit. Notice Y is essentially true any time A, B, or C. Anytime A, B, or C are true. Um, uh, anytime two, two or more are true, right? And this is true. So that fits what we would expect. But we could match this, right? And so we could see um, this sort of fitting with our truth table, right? Where each of these 10 nanoseconds would be essentially a row in our truth table. So our simulation, we can verify this behavior works, right? And simulation is going to be quicker than actually implementing this on the board. And so a simulation, again, is kind of a nice step, less time consuming than actually implementing it and checking it with switches and LEDs. Maybe not quite as gratifying or entertaining or maybe interesting, but um, time-wise, it's a more useful use of my time because if this doesn't work, right, I don't need to look at it on hardware. I could go back to my design and go, something's wrong, and I could change it, and then I could go back to my simulation and I could run it again, right, and then look at my waveform to see. So simulation. Right. important step um, in the process. This looks good. So I can close my simulation. So I'm back to my design. And so the last thing I want to do is I want to implement this on my FPGA board. Right. And so this brings up a couple of things. One, creating a file that I can program with is relatively straightforward but I need to connect my inputs and outputs to something, something real, something useful. And so since I have some switches here, I'm gonna connect my A, B, and C to my switches. So I've got 16 switches. So I will use zero, one, and two for A, B, and C. Seems fairly straightforward. And then above here, I have 16 LEDs um, above my switches. And so I will connect X and Y to LED zero and LED one. And so the important thing is, is that when I'm connecting this, right, I need to know what pins on my FPGA chip do I need to connect to A, B, and C and X and Y? Because that's what Rivado needs to do in order to sort of route this thing out, right? When it implements it, it needs to know how do I connect them because those are certain pins and connected to specific things on this board. So, Bovado doesn't know that I'm using this board. This board was made by Digilent, and so Digilent has a reference material that tells you which pins are connected to which things on the board. Um, now, some of these pins actually are labeled fairly well. If you can kind of read the silkscreen printing, um, it actually has them, and so you can kind of see them there. Um, I like actually looking at their reference material and so they have a very nice reference manual all online, right? You can go to Digilent. Um, you can look up the basis three and 
they have links directly to this reference center. And the section we want to look at is we want to know the things that are connected to the switches and the LEDs, and that happens to be basic I.O. So we are going to click on this basic I.O., which takes us here. And so all of these designations like W19, V17, U1, right? These are all pin designations that we can use to specify what's connected to what. And then this will tell us um, where we need to connect things to. Right? So I want A connected to V17, B connected to V16, right? C connected to W16, and so forth and so on. Um, and this is what we can look at to kind of see uh, LEDs up here, U16, E19, right? And so I can connect X and Y to those. And so that's the information I need to um, create the last file that I want. And this last file is called a constraint file. So the last step, creating a constraints file, right? So it's the last file that we need. And so again, we go back to add sources, just like before. It's not a design source. It's not a simulation source. It is a constraint. And so it's called a constraints because it's constraining inputs and outputs to specific pins or parameters of our FPGA. And so again, we could add a file, right? If you had a constraints file previously created, um, Digital also provides sort of a master constraints file that you can find, and it has all of the switches, LEDs, everything um, already listed. You just uh, need to essentially uncomment the files out that you don't want or the lines that you don't want and change what they're connected to. Um, and so that's an option um, for this. This thing is so simple for what I'm doing, and it's just easier for me to write my own. Um, and so I'm going to create a file, and it is an XDC file, so the default here is fine. And so um, I like, again, calling it the device that I'm making, right, which is this top-level device demo, and then um, I usually underscore cons. Uh, may not need this uh, because it's a different extension type, but um, this tells me it's the constraints file for this part. So it's useful. Finish. And so this constraints file shows up under here, right? So I can double click it. And constraints are empty, right? Um, because they are fairly bare bones. Um, and it's uh, just a specific syntax language for this XDC file, which is um, of Avado Xilinx specification on how they use to connect uh, parts and do layout and routing. And so there's a couple keywords that are necessary. And so essentially we need two lines, two lines of code, two lines of description for every um, pin. So we have A, B, and C, X, and Y. So we've got five pins. So we just need 10 lines here. And so each pin has two lines. Um, both start with this set property. And so you'll see it highlights it as a keyword and then package pin. And so this is where we then need the pin that we want to use. And so um, in this case, if we're going to, let's start with A, B, and C, we're using switches. So switch zero is V17. So package pin V17. And then a bracket, get ports. Again, get ports is a keyword. And then we want to connect what the logical thing is that we're going to connect to. So in this case, A, and then we close the bracket out. So this is one line that's needed, right? Set property, package pin. The pin on the device that we're using, get ports. And then what is the logical signal that we are connecting it to? Right? Sometimes you will see this get ports have um, braces around it. 
Uh, typically, this becomes useful if we're doing multiple bus um, pins, then typically the braces show up. Um, you can have them. It's not going to hurt anything if they're there. So that's the first line. The second line for each pin, right? Again, set property. But now instead of package pin, it's IO standard. Um, IO standard, LV CMOS 3.3. And then again, get ports. And I'm going to use my braces, uh, A. And so this is actually setting the voltage standard. And so this is saying that you know we're using a CMOS of 3.3 volts for all of the pins. Um, and so, but essentially these are the two lines that we need for every pin. So I'm just going to copy both of these. And so the next one is going to be B. And B, let's see is going to be V16, so V16. Um, I don't need to have a space in between these. I'm only doing that, um, this blank space, I'm only doing it for readability. So port C is W16. Okay, so those are my three switches. So then I have my LEDs, and they work exactly the same way. Um, U16. And we'll call that X. And then E19. E19. We will call that Y. Connect that to Y. Unfortunately, there's no quick syntax highlighting for this. Um, you won't know if you have any mistakes in this constraint file until you do a full synthesis. Um, this is a little annoying, but it's usually fairly straightforward and simple. Um, two lines, right? So we should have these set up. And so we now have everything we need. Um, to be ready to build a file that we can program our basis board with. And so this process, essentially there's three steps in the process of making this, right? First, we synthesize it, in which case Vivado um, takes our HDL language and turns this into kind of a net list and see if it synthesizes it, see if it um, uh, deconstructs the logic. Uh, it will implement this where it'll do kind of a layout on the FPGA board. And then we can generate a bitstream file, which is actually a file that we can use to program our FPGA with, right? And so sometimes you can just click bitstream and it'll do the other processes ahead of it. Um, or you can just start with synthesis and then it'll give you pop-ups um, as each step is done. So I'm just gonna start with running a synthesis. Usually when it's running, I always like to um, look at my messages. Um, infos and status are usually um, more information than is useful. I usually like warnings. If there's any warning or errors that show up, um, they always pop up here. And so this is worthwhile to check to see um, if there's problems through this process. Uh, the telltale signs that something's not right that needs to be fixed. And so warnings can sometimes be important. Some warnings can be ignored. Um, there's a library path that doesn't exist. Um, that's fine. Um, there's this uh, incremental compile, right? This is really only useful in, in very complex designs or something like this um, that's also not important. And so um, incrementing compile is it may even be an advanced feature um, that might not be available in the free version, the educational version for Vivado. Um, you'll notice the synthesis design, right? It tells you right here that it's running. Um, and so it's processing, right? This does take uh, a little bit of time, 
even for a simple design like we have, um, which kind of highlights the reason why I suggested to do the RTL elaborated design and the simulation first, right? So synthesis was successful. Um, the only warning we got was this parallel synthesis, which is fine. There's nothing to parallelize in the synthesis, but it's going to automatically say, hey, do we want to run an implementation? Yes, we do. That's the next step. So that's sort of step two in the process. So I've done a synthesis that worked out well. Um, and now it's running an implementation. And so it's initializing things. The other thing we can see throughout this process, we can go to this project summary um, and we can get a synopsis, right? Synthesis happened, right? It had this one warning. Um, we can see it's implementing, it's running. Uh, we can look at how much of our FPJ we're using, right? As far as how much of the IOs, right? How many pins are we utilizing? And then how many of the lookup tables, um, you know, rough estimate logic gates. And you can see this design is hardly using anything on our FPGA, right? And so very minimal. So still running, right? Running implementation right here or here, right? We can see both spots. So it looks like we've got one warning. So it's not in timing mode, right? And this actually makes sense because I didn't have a clock, right? This design is it's very simple, no clock. And so since there's no clock, there's really no timing per se. Um, and so it's skipping that aspect of it. Minimize these, minimize these. So our implementation was done. And so you could open the implementation, right? Which um, may be interesting. It kind of shows you the FPGA and it shows you the aspects where it's actually using the lookup tables on the physical device, right? Which, which location um, essentially is it utilizing. Um, for us, it's not really that important. And so I'm just gonna tell it to go ahead and create the bit stream, right? It did have a couple warnings, so let's look at these. Um, no user-defined clocks, right? As I mentioned, that makes sense. Um, since there's no clocks, right, timing and power, it can't do those things. So it's saying, hey, I didn't do any power estimation, um, which is fine. And then uh, no timing analysis. So no timing analysis, no, so no power. Um, I can't tell if it's going to um, meet timing, how much slack, how much negative slack or positive slack, right? Again, if we had a um, more robust design that, that had a clock that had flip-flops, um, those things would show up uh, here under our timing. And so we could see, does it meet setup and hold and those types of parameters? Um, so again, this warning makes sense for the designs that we have for the um, device. And so we can kind of ignore those. And so it's running the bitstream, right? We can see this. Okay. And so the bitstream is done. Cool. And so I'm not going to worry about opening the implemented design. So I'm just going to cancel here. I don't need anything else to open. Um, in the writing the bitstream, right? Uh, let's see. So the bitstream, we get this DRC warning. And so this was um, a default voltage level wasn't defined as either ground or VCC. Um, and there's a line we could have added in the constraints file to get rid of this warning. Um, I wasn't really worried about it because uh, um, we're not dealing with it. But so this is a common warning that shows up depending upon which version of Avada you have. Um, in some older versions, they never bothered with making this a warning. And then in newer versions, um, they started making this a warning. So anyway, this uh, 
CFGVVS voltage. Um, I'm not going to worry about it. And again, there's, there's um, I forget what the line is, but there's a line that you can add in the constraints file that will um, get rid of it. You essentially define it as something. Okay, but so now I have a bit file, right? This bit file has been written. And so now I just need to program the board. So I have plugged in my um, basis board. And so I can program it by opening this hardware manager over here on the left. If I open the hardware manager, um, it comes up here. Uh, and there's a couple places I could tell it to open the target here with this auto connect or open target, or usually I'm over here already. And so I just click open target, auto connect. And so assuming um, drivers have been installed. And so drivers for Vigilance devices are typically included defaultly with um, most versions of Avado. And so it should already be there and set up. Um, and so when it's plugging in, it should be connecting. So we can see, right, this matches, right? And this is good, right? Here's a device. If you recall, when we first made the project, this was the device that we used, right? And so this is important because um, if we had originally set our project up to have a different device, then um, we won't be able to program it, right? Because it was made for a different FPGA chip, right? If that happened, there are options under, is it that? I believe. Settings. Yes, project settings. You could go in here and you could change it. All right. And so this is what we want. This is what we have. All right. And so you could click on and change this to something differently. Uh, the key is that if you did this, you'd have to, to redo the whole synthesis implementation and um, generate bit file. Okay. But so anyway, so our device is there, it's connected. Um, and so then we just need to tell it to program the device, which device, this one. Um, if we had multiple devices connected, then we'd have multiple options here. Only one board connected, so here we go. Bitstream it automatically populated the um, dialog box with where the bitstream is. But if you were ever curious to where it was saved, right, here's the full path. So inside your project directory, there's a runs, an implementation, and then there it is. Notice the bit file is named after the top level module. And so the top level module is demo, so it's demo.bit. But we click program. It goes through, um, and we should see some LEDs change on our board here, right? Essentially, this becomes green. And so uh, as we flip up some switches, right, notice we get some LEDs that show up. And so um, right, we could essentially kind of go through all of our input combinations, right, um, and see Right, that this actually should match again our truth table, right? So anyway, we could go through this process and this should match, this should essentially exactly match the eight possibilities that were in our sim. Um, but now we have our design and our device actually running on our FPGA connected to switches and LEDs, right? And so there you go. Um, setting up a project in Bovado, um, writing your design file, simulating it, looking at the elaborated design to kind of make sure that your design makes sense, simulating it, creating a test bench to make sure that the behavior works properly. And then after doing all of that, knowing that your design is good, you can go ahead and create a bit file um, and program your board. So hopefully that was useful. Um, thank you.